Leslie, if I am not given the opportunity to teach up here and they need somebody back there, it's my favorite time as a teacher. Kids are so easy. Like the goofy you are, the cooler they think you are, right? And they're so pure, right? In comparison to you guys, right? <laughs> I'm having to like hammer through all of this blockage, but with those kids, the sincerity in their eyes, it's like, man. Nice, now that I've made fun of you and pointed out your sinfulness, my name is Evan. It's nice to be here with you all, a fellow sinner for sure. So this morning, we are starting our study through Deuteronomy. I heard one positive response. I'm curious your guys' reaction to that. Right? Anybody confused, right? not really sure what to think about Deuteronomy because you're not really sure what this book is? Right? Anybody else besides Paul and I excited, Old Testament nerds out there? See one or two hands. Right? How about hesitant? Right? Anybody a little cautious? Book full of laws right, that were given 3,500 years ago that definitely don't apply to us. And I imagine there's a plethora of reactions for us as a community spending five months studying through this book. Right? One that seems to be very rarely, if ever, studied through by a church. Right? Since I have both have the microphone and I am also the reason why we're studying through this, I wanted to start this morning by telling you my reaction kind of give you an intro to the sermon series as a whole. As a pastor of this community, I'm both excited and interested to see the different ways that God uses this book to transform us into a more holy and a more effective community, one that's living in the midst of a nation that is fully rejecting the God of the Bible and the truth that it brings. Now, I say holy because Deuteronomy is calling its reader, both the Israelites then and us now, to live the way that we were made to live in total reliance on God. And I say effective because in this book are truths that can compel and even, compa- even empower a people to be a light in the midst of darkness. As we study through Deuteronomy, you'll see that this book is not outdated or irrelevant. It wasn't for Jesus and his followers. It wasn't for the apostles. And they lived 1,500 years after it was written in a completely different culture. Now, most scholars believe that Deuteronomy was the most influential book on New Testament individuals and writers. This comes from the fact that Jesus quoted or alluded to this book 10 different times, and the New Testament writers did the same nearly 80 times in their writing. There are quotes from Deuteronomy in all but six of the New Testament books. The only other two books that are more quoted, Psalms and Isaiah. This means that this book was a bedrock that they continually return to in order to discover how they should be living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, which is the same place that we are today. Now, we see Jesus doing this, returning to Deuteronomy, when the king of this world, Satan, tries to tempt him and lure him away from the path that his father was laying out in front of him at the beginning of his world-shaking ministry. Now, Satan's temptations come in three different ways, through pleasure and comfort, through the approval of others, and through power. Sounds a lot like our culture, doesn't it? And do you know how Jesus denied these temptations? All three times, guess what he quoted? Deuteronomy. Now, if even Jesus needed to be anchored in the absolute truths that were given through Moses to the people of Israel in the 15th century BC, so that way he wouldn't be swept away in the current of what he was in, that means we definitely need the anchor that's found in this truth. As we walk chapter by chapter through this book, learning about the real life story that was unfolding before the Israelites back in 1400 BC, we will discover deeper principles that directly apply to our lives today. And in those, I know that you'll be both encouraged and challenged. And we'll be encouraged because of the ways that it shows us of who God is and what he is capable of doing to a people that willingly trust and follow his leadings. But we'll also be challenged by the way that he is calling us to live. The path of life that he laid out through the instructions given by Moses and the law, right? they are far different than the ones of our culture. In Deuteronomy, we will be continually challenged to elevate God and his ways above everything else. Unlike modern-day America and our relativistic view on everything, right, we have this mindset that's encouraging us to be like a pile of leaves blown around by the wind, just following every fleeting emotion and logic that seems to come our way. But in Deuteronomy, we'll be clearly shown that the only way to the abundant life is through devotion to our Creator and Savior. 
Hunter, go ahead and put that slide back up if you would. It shows the title of this series, Devotion. Now, those of you that are getting to know me, you probably know that I love words, right? That's why I write out my sermons, so that way I can precisely communicate what I feel like I'm supposed to communicate. Now, this word devotion, it means the state of being dedicated, consecrated, or solemnly set apart for a particular purpose. Ben, he's the head pastor of our entire church, Rim Rock. He chose this title for the sermon series. Now, I wasn't fully sold on it until I actually looked into what devotion means. As you'll see, throughout Moses' end of his life sermon, he is telling the Israelites over and over that the main prerogative of, in the mission that lies ahead of them, right, the one to conquer the land of Canaan and in their day-to-day -day lives, their main goal is to be fully dedicated, consecrated, or solemnly set apart for the, to the will of Yahweh, their God. As a people, their primary concern needed to be stay, to stay fully devoted to God. And as a result, Right? This is the same message that you'll hear week in, week out from up here. The one that God is communicating to us today. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are called to live a life that is set apart for a particular purpose that God has for us. Not our fleeting emotions or our ever-changing logic, not the trends of our culture, but the plans that God has for our lives. Like I said, this will be challenging. But the benefits that come from devotion to the one who knit together our reality and gives us life day after day, they are worth everything. All right, so there's your Deuteronomy pep talk. Hope you guys are excited now. Man, I should have had my wife bust out her pom-poms from high school and do a real pep rally. Maybe next time, huh, Ross? I know you're there somewhere. All right, for the rest of our time, we're going to tackle the first chapter and a half of Deuteronomy. I know, that's a ton. Because we didn't want to spend the next few years walking verse by verse through this book, you'll see that each week we cover a pretty large amount in a flyover fashion, similar to how we approach Revelation. You guys remember that book of Revelation last year? Right? And that means that if you want to go deeper than just the themes and the bigger picture, what do you have to do? You have to study it on your own. And so what Hunter just put up is a study guide. Right, QR code, you can scan it. This will be up before and after each service. Ben, the head pastor, put together this beautifully laid out study guide that goes through each week of what we're studying. Right, gives you a nice little intro. It'll get you thinking and then some questions. Right, if you don't know how to use that QR code, there's 25 of these. We only printed off 25 because we wanted to save some trees, right, encouraging us to go more of the electronic fashion. But there's 25 of those out back. Another really good way to go deeper is through small groups. We have several that meet throughout the week. Derek, the community pastor down here, he's got all the info on that. So talk to him if you want to know more. Okay, let's start studying. So in the first five verses of this book, we get an opening statement that sets the premise of everything that will follow. Deuteronomy 1, verses 1 through 5. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness on the plain opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel, Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. By the way of Mount Seir, it takes 11 days to reach Kadesh Barnea from Horeb. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the Israelites just as the Lord had commanded him to speak to them. This was after he had defeated King Sihon of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, and King Og of Bashan, who reigned in Asheroth and in Edri. Beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law as follows. So this sets the stage. The Israelites are now camped on the east side of the Jordan, just opposite the land of Canaan. So this kind of the green is where they, on the left-hand side, is where they left Egypt, right? Across the Red Sea and then go up to Mount Sinai, which is still where that green stuff is at the very bottom, the southern end. And then after they receive the law, they head back up. And we'll talk about how that wandering that happened. But these guys are now at the top right, overlooking the land of Canaan. You can see the word Canaan to the left of where they're currently at. 40 years ago, right, 40 years before Moses starts giving this, the people of Israel were rescued from Egypt. They walked through the Red Sea, and they spent a year camped around Mount Sinai where God gave them the law. We can read about that in Exodus and Leviticus. 
After that, due to their lack of trusting God, they wandered around the desert for nearly 40 years. Sounds like 39 years and 11 months um, from those first five verses that we just read. This is the book of Numbers. Now that that time of wandering has ended and this com massive community of recently freed slaves is on the cusp of charging headfirst into a promised land to fight against a really well-established nation, right? because of this, Moses, their God-appointed leader, has some things to say to them before he goes the way of the earth. Right? He's about to die. And he wants to communicate some deeper principles before he passes his role off to Joshua. So that means Deuteronomy is essentially an old and wide, wise sage speaking words of wisdom to a younger and more foolish nation of pu pu pupils, ones of whom he has cared for year after year after year through many difficult and trying times. At the end of his life, he wants to pass on words of wisdom so that way things go well for them as they continue on their way. Now, before we look at the first words of wisdom, I want to help us see a little bit of direct application that this has overarching in our lives. In at least two different ways, we are metaphorically doing what God had called the Israelites to do 3,500 years ago. We are conquering the promised land. The first is internal. Every single one of us is hostile ground. Right? Let me say that a little bit more precisely. Within every single one of us is hostile ground. Because of the sins of our ancestors, specifically Adam and Eve, right, we are all born sinful. From the moment of conception, we enter this world in a broken, with broken and selfish tendencies, what the Bible calls our flesh. Now, our flesh is the deeper part within us that drives us to elevate ourselves and our own thoughts and our own desires above that of God and his plans for our lives. <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of verses so that way it's not just me and my logic. Romans 7. Verses 14 through 18. For now we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh. That's what I'm referring to, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not know what I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing, for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Down in verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? We also see him kind of laying out this battle within us for the internal promised land in Galatians 5, the battle between the spirit and the flesh. Live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. Right? Specifically following Jesus. Now for those of us that have discovered Jesus and his power, Paul so clearly lays out that the battlegrounds right, that we are in the midst of, it is our lives. Right? Yes, we were born into sin, and then we were saved by God and his redeeming power and grace, but we are not yet fully free. Every day, there is a battle raging within us between the spirit of God and the mind that he is continually re repurposing, transforming. Right? A battle between that and our old and hardened, broken nature. Each day, we are confronted with the battle of, tr do I trust God? Do I trust his power? Do I trust his plans? Or do I, do I trust that innate desire and those habits, right? The ones that I built within me over years and years of stupid choices. This is one of our promised lands that God is calling us to conquer. Our mind and our emotions. The other one, metaphorically, is a bit more tangible and familiar to, fairly similar to the promised land for the Israelites the culture by which we are surrounded. In the same way that the Israelites moved into a foreign land surrounded by the ideologies and the actions of nations that believed in deeper principles far different than their own, we are in the same spot. Like I already mentioned, we are surrounded by a crooked and perverse generation that is bent on glorifying themselves above anything else. But this world, specifically this town, Rapid City, Right? This has been given to us by our creator. And we, his followers, his children, should be on a mission to destroy and remove false ideologies. 
Not the people that hold them, but the belief systems that are pushing them deeper and deeper into darkness. Right? We have discovered truth that set us free, and we should be now helping those around us discover the same things. In this way, our town, our workplace, even our families are our promised lands. Because of our metaphorical promised lands, the ones within us, the ones all around us, the words and the wisdom that Moses give is giving to Israel back then, right, before they enter the land of Canaan, they need to be ones that we listen to and then ask God, all right, how does this apply to my life today? And the first one that we see Moses giving to his pupils is pointing out the mistakes of their parents. Interesting way to start, huh? Moses is basically saying, you have scary but incredible things that lie ahead of you. I want to help you. The first thing that you need to know is that your parents messed up in serious ways. Now, I believe the primary reason he starts with this is out of the hopes that this generation will not fall victim to that famous line that we all know, right? Whoever does not learn from history, what happens? They're doomed to repeat it. Let me show you in the Bible what I'm talking about. Now, after that first five-verse intro that we just read, Moses then recounts the past 40 years of Israelite history, specifically focusing in on a major mistake that was made over and over, to not trust God. In verses 6 through 8 in Deuteronomy 1, he describes the way that God had called them to move from Mount Sinai into, a, into the land of the Canaanites, the one that he had promised to Moses, or excuse me, to Abraham long ago. In verses 9 through 18, Moses then tells about how he saw handling the daily affairs of a nation as overwhelming, right? He couldn't handle the small things, so he brought in a lot of other leaders to help guide the nation in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, I feel like the reason why he's doing this, thinking more big picture, is because he wanted this generation to know that he was not a dictator, but he rather led more democratically, right? The people always had a choice of what they would do. When we get to verse 19, right, for another 30, 25 verses, he describes to the people standing in front of him the specific ways that their parents, the generation before them, had chosen to overtly disobey God and the consequences that follow. Now, many of you probably already know this story from Sunday school, or maybe you've spent some time reading through Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? But let me give you a quick refresher. It'll be so quick, so please Please go home and read this on your own. After the Israelites, excuse me, after God had pulled the Israelites out of the cruel hand of Pharaoh and given them the laws by which they could create and govern their nation, he instructs them to go into Canaan and conquer the land, right? He had promised this to Abraham 400 years prior. Now, because the people, right, their parents were interested or maybe even a bit concerned about what they would find in there, they came up with the idea of sending in spies, one from each tribe. Now, when the, the spies came back, you guys remember what 10 out of the 12 said? We cannot go in there, right? Giants. And we see this in verse 28. Where are we headed, they said after the spies came back. Our kindred has, have made our hearts melt by reporting. The people are stronger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified up to heaven. We actually saw the offspring of the Anakim, right? Giants. Now, this may seem like a logical response to us. You are a recently freed people that have little to no experience in battle, and God is sending you into a well-established and fortified nation full of giants. Right? Of course they'd be scared to do this. Right? But the nice thing is, to go a little bit deeper in our understanding, in verses 29 through 33, Moses lays out the heart of the issue. I, Moses, said to you, have no dread or fear of them. The Lord your God who goes before you is the one who will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as one carries a child, all the way you traveled until you reached this place. But in spite of this, you have no trust in the Lord your God who goes before you on the way to seek out a place for you to camp in fire by night and in cloud by day to show you the route you should take. Moses reminds them of why they are going into the land and why they have no need to be afraid. 
Because the same one that miraculously freed them from Egypt has been with them every single day. And he is the one going ahead of them to do the hard job. Moses is pointing out that the true question that lies before them isn't, can we conquer the land of Canaan? It is, do we trust Yahweh? Sadly, they choose to dig their heels into the sand and refuse to listen to God and obey him. Because of their choice not to trust him, God gives them the natural cause and effect of their choice. He doesn't drive out the inhabitants before them. Now, do they have a land they can go back to? No. And they're not following him into this beautiful land that lies ahead of them. So therefore, naturally, what are they forced to do? Wander. Right? We see this kind of laid out, verses 34 through 36. When the Lord heard your words, he was wrathful and swore, not one of these, not one of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give your ancestors. Except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him and his descendants I will give the land on which he set foot because of his complete fidelity or trust to the Lord. Now, I know this may sound harsh. A scared people running from the scary plan that God put in front of them, and they are punished to this level? Really? But let me point out a couple things that have really helped me better understand the situation, and even more so, show me who God is in the midst of this. The first is the heart or the mindset of the people. We see this back in verses 26 and 27, before they say, we can't go in. Verse 26, but you were unwilling to go up, right, the Israelites. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in the tents and said, listen to this, it is because the Lord hates us that he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. You guys catch that? Because the Lord hates us that he took us out of slavery. Right? God had miraculously walked, out, walked them out of oppressive slavery in Egypt, set them free from violent and crushing circumstances that they could not escape. And then in this moment, they say that God hated them by doing this, by wanting to lead them into a land flowing with milk and honey. The main reason God is not allowing this generation of people to enter the promised land is because they trust in him in little to no way at all. And the most important element of success in anything is trusting God. Right? Like I mentioned to you over and over in our study through the first part of Genesis, a fundamental p- part of God's design for humanity is free will. Because he loves us, he will never force us to do anything. And that includes trust him. But when you are given an incredible opportunity like this, conquering the land of Canaan, trusting God is the only way that it will ever happen. So that means if you choose not to trust him, then what will happen? You will not succeed. Let me give you an analogy. It's like the Israelites are a little kid whose parents are trying to teach him how to ride a bike without training wheels. Now, anybody done this for your kids? Right? Now, what is the most essential part of success in this feat? Is it for the kid to come up with excuses and have the mindset that my parent my parent hates me because they gave me a bicycle with two wheels instead of a tricycle with three. They obviously hate me. If they just gave me that tricycle, I would be set. No. The most essential thing is that they trust the parent and their guidance in order to show them how to take on this scary but incredible freedom. The only way for the Israelites to defeat the armies of Canaan was to trust God and his power to do it, and they chose not to do it. We see another example of this in verses 41 through 45. So after God told them, you're not going in, the Israelites answered, we have sinned against the Lord. We are ready to go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. So all of you strapped on your battle gear and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. But look what the Lord says to them. Do not go up. Do not fight, please, for I am not in the midst of you. Otherwise, you will be defeated by your enemies. Although I told you, Moses, you would not listen. You rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the hill country, trusting themselves, their own logic, their own emotion. The Amorites who lived in that hill country then came out against you and chased you as bees do. They beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. When you returned and wept before the Lord, the Lord would neither heed your voice nor pay any attention. 
So it seems like because the Israelites figured out the natural consequences of their choice to not trust God and they did not like it, they're like, man, this is not what we want. They quickly threw out this insincere apology and then rushed into battle. Even though God said what? Don't do it. You're not trusting me. Please don't go. But once again, they choose not to trust him, right? And they reap the natural consequences that flow from it. For me, this has been clearly showing that by not allowing this generation to enter the promised land, God was simply giving them what they wanted to not put their trust in him and then receive all of the benefits that he wanted to give to them. And I hope this is making sense. Another really important thing to know about this, I believe this was more of discipline than punishment. If God was punishing them, he would have simply laid out their penalties and then walked away. But you guys see that he stuck with them for 40 years during this time of trial? Right? In describing this time of discipline, Moses puts it this way. I got two different verses. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Surely the Lord your God has blessed you in all your undertakings. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. Why? These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. And we see a little bit more detail given. Chapter 29, verse 5. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Get this. The clothes on your back have not worn out, and the sandals on your feet have not worn out. Imagine that, walking around the desert day after day in these thin little pieces of rubber. I don't even know what kind of clothes they have. But ours wouldn't even last. And here, God gave them that miraculous provision. These verses show that God remained with them during the 40 years of wandering. Why? So that way he could protect and provide for them, which then shows me that this wasn't just punishment, right? This is much more of a discipline. Now, if God was punishing them, right, he would have just walked away, said, all right, this is what you want, but he didn't do that because he was hoping that they would learn from their foolish mistakes and then turn back to him. We get a beautiful passage on discipline in Hebrews 12. And this is one that's a full sermon in and of itself. I just want to point it out to you. Hebrews 12, verse 7 through 11. Endure trials for the sake of discipline, right? Your own stupid choices. God is treating you as a child. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not as children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. Now discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Man, I love that. It's something I'm going to spend a lot more time looking at in the weeks to come. By seeing the fallout of the Israelites' choice to not enter the promised land through these two lenses. The first, as a natural byproduct of the choices that they made, and the second, as more of discipline than punishment. These two guiding thoughts have helped me better understand why things rolled out the way that they did. And this has helped me better understand or more correctly see who God is in this fairly controversial passage. For me, seeing this circumstance in the way I just described, it allows me to continue to see God in the same way I see him through the rest of the Bible, even through Jesus and his time on earth. God is giving his people an incredible opportunity to be used by him to bring his kingdom into a fallen world. But it is, as always, fully their choice. And when they choose not to trust and follow him, what does he do? He allows them to go their own way. But he still never abandons them. He stays with them as they suffer the consequences of their own choices, continually providing and protecting them in the midst of the mess that they created. One other component that I'm, lean, that I'm learning and starting to believe is that this generation, the one that God said you will not enter the promised land, I believe that they would have actually been allowed to enter it if they would have chosen to actually repent. You know, being the theologian that I am, which I don't have any degrees, I'm just kidding. Being a theologian that I am, I did the most effective Bible study that I do. It's called a Google search, right? And I typed in verses on repentance. I'm serious. This is how I learn more of the Bible than any other way. And then a website comes up and it just lists endless verses that has the word repentance on that. 
And from that, I started to see many verses showing God's illogical response to genuine repentance. Let me show you just two of them. First one's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. So clearly stated, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance, what will he do? I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I will lead them into the promised land. We see a real obvious example of this in the book of Jonah. You guys remember why Jonah went to Nineveh? What he wanted to tell him? You're going to be destroyed. Forty days, you're wiped out. But then we see in chapter 3, verse 10 of Jonah, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, repented, what did God do? God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And because of these and so many others, I am to the point where I firmly believe that the generation that died off in the wilderness could have actually been spared from the full consequences of their choices, their rebellion, if they would have done what we just read about in Second Chronicles. Humble themselves, pray, seek God's face, and then turn from their wicked ways. But because they didn't, God allowed their discipline to continue throughout the rest of their lives because they were unwilling to learn from it. And I hope you are understanding the truth of our God that these passages are showing. God is always loving and gracious, wanting to lead us, everyone, into the best life possible. But he is also holy and just, which means that he allows us to experience the consequences of our choices. And the choice is always in our hands. And what I just laid out is a description of a loving father. And this is why God, through Moses, is telling this generation, the next one, the fatal mistakes of their parents in hopes that they will listen and then they can learn from somebody else's mistakes and then make better choices in their own lives. Specifically, the biggest one, to trust him fully. All right, even though I can't see you due to my bright lights, I know you guys are zoning me out. Your attention spans are dwindling. But just stick with me for a couple more minutes so that way I can directly apply this to us right now. As I've been meditating on this passage for a solid week, something keeps coming to my mind, more of the overarching principles that we are seeing here. If we want to fully experience God and his incredible plans for our lives, to metaphorically enter our promised lands, right, mentally as well as with those around us, we have to be willing to learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of others. If we simply turn a blind eye to them, God's grace will cover it, which it will, right? But if we take that approach, then we will be unable to fully experience God and his incredible plans for our lives. And I hope that statement makes sense. If not, let me show you a cartoon and read a poem, one that you guys will remember long after you forget everything I say. Something missing. I remember I put on my socks. I remember I put on my shoes. I remember I put on my tie that was painted in beautiful purples and blues. I remember I put on my coat to look perfectly grand at the dance. Yet I feel there is something missing I may have forgot. What is it? What is it? I happened to read this this week with my kids. And I saw, man, what a beautiful analogy for what we're looking at. Each day, as we're getting dressed for success so that way we can conquer our promised lands, we so often include the most important things to our ensemble, such as inviting God in the morning into our day or expressing gratitude for what he has given us. Right? Throughout the day, we try to love other people really well, and we want to be honest and trustworthy, hardworking, all these really good things. Right? We do so many of the things that we need to do in order to be really well-equipped for what lies ahead of us, but this week, I'm realizing that I'm often walking around each day with no pants on. From what I'm learning in Deuteronomy 1, along with those other things that I know I need in my life, I must also be humble enough to admit my failures, think through them, and then learn lessons from them. I have to be willing to repent. You can take that down, Hunter. You know, if I don't, if I don't humble myself, if I don't learn from my lessons... What will happen? You guys remember the second half of that well-known saying? I will be doomed to repeat them time and time again. Now to do this, to repent, we must first ask God to point out our sins. 
He did it for the Israelites, and he will do it for us. I know that God deeply desires for us to conquer the giants that are hiding behind the shadows in our minds. The simple and I think the easiest way to figure out your sins is by journaling. Now, at the end of the day, reflect on how things went, right? And then be willing to admit to yourself the small and everyday mistakes and then ponder on them. Think about how things went in your marriage, those small little conversations that you had, that one that was a little bit tense, or with your coworkers, right, people that you see every day, or with your kids, right? I remember that time that I was just a little too harsh, right? Think through why you were doing that and ask God to show you that deeper root cause that's bringing that about. If you're willing, you can also do this with the bigger problems that you face in the past in your life. Take some time to think about, think over the past decade or two when everything fell apart. Right? I guarantee every single person in this room has a moment or 10 just like that. Take some time to think about asking God, all right, what was the root cause that led to that atomic bomb in my life. Now, even though I said this is the easiest way, it doesn't mean that it'll be easy. Admitting failures is never fun. But a crucial thing to keep in mind is God's stance towards you through all of this. Before you did it, he already knew that you would do it. Right? Nothing surprises him. And according to what we see in Hebrews, right, if you call upon the name of Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven, past, present, and the future. That means that if you are willing to bring your sins before God, he will openly grab a hold of you in the midst of your sorrow and help you walk through it the way that a loving father does with his kids. I found a verse that kind of talks about this. You know, I'm all about just showing the Bible. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. Please catch this. For you felt a godly grief, so that way you are not harmed anyway by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. But worldly grief produces death. As you walk through the things that you, the mistakes that you have made, hang on to that idea of having godly grief, regret, sorrow. You know, one other way, and I'll end with this, to reflect on, repent from, and to learn from your mistakes, this one's going to be even harder, is by telling your children or a younger generation about your mistakes. Now, this is the one that is definitely not easy, but I cannot get away from it based on Deuteronomy 1 and 2. The reason that Moses is telling the younger generation about the sins of their parents is because it is a powerful teaching tool. When a parent is humble enough to share their struggles with their kids, it is noteworthy and very memorable and can be a way to spare them, their child, from experiencing the hard things that they personally went through. Remember, one of our promised lands is our family. Now, I know this isn't easy, but I know firsthand how powerful it can be. Before I sailed away to Hawaii with college and when I was 20 years old, the night before I flew out, my mom sat down with me and she told me of one of the struggles that she had experienced when she was my age. And then she said, no matter what you do, know that I will love you. And I still remember that as if it was yesterday. And it changed the, my view of my mom in significant ways. Out of her doing that, I'm starting to realize that I have been subconsciously encouraged to do the same thing for my kids. Right? I've told you guys so many different times of my struggle with seeking pleasure, being a pothead, doing anything that would bring me like that deeper, not even deeper, just that, that uh, surface level pleasure. I struggled with it for 15 years of my life, and I've been finding myself being willing to talk to my 8-year-old daughter and my 10-year-old son to keep them from experiencing the exact same thing. So as I finally stopped talking, Please, if nothing else, leave here asking God if there are any struggles that he wants you to share with others. It may be your kids, right? It may be your niece or nephew. It may be like your coworkers, people that are 10, 20 years younger than you. It doesn't matter. Just ask God, is there somebody that you want me to share my failures with for their sake? But please make sure you have genuinely repented for that sin before you share it with others. 
I'm worried that if we bring up something that we haven't moved into the position of godly grief and repentance on yet, right, what we were reading about in 2 Corinthians, if we're still hanging on to it with some bitterness, that that will come out. And that will taint the lesson that God and you want to teach those people. Right? Repentance is key in this life. Because of that, do not leave your house this week without putting your pants on. Okay. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm serious with that one. Let me read one more to you. Revelation. This is Jesus talking to the churches, to us. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and what? Repent. He continues, listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear 